Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Folsom Lake College's fall 2018-19 academic year. Woohoo! <laughs> this is an exciting day for those of us here at FLC and for Los Rios because we are being live streamed. We are lucky to have not one, not two, but three trustees with us here this afternoon. So please give a round of applause to Board President Pamela Haynes. <laughs> Vice President of the Board, John Knight. That means you have to come out. <laughs> and Trustee Robert Jones, who's out in the audience somewhere. <laughs> and without further ado, Trustee Knight. Thank you, Whitney, very much. Yeah, and thank you for my other colleagues to joining me here. So uh, they will always keep me in line, so I appreciate that very much. But on behalf of um, all of the trustees, I'm thrilled to be here at Folsom Lake College to help kick off the fall semester. The fall semester is especially exciting as we all prepare to welcome thousands of students to this campus for, mar for maybe the very first time. My colleagues and I on the Los Rios board know what an important time it is at Folsom Lake College, as, we, <clears throat> as well as it is all for community colleges throughout the state of California. As we move through unprecedented, exciting changes, and those changes almost always result in important conversations and an extraordinary amount of hard work for both all the faculty and staff members. So thank you for your dedication, your creativity, your passion, and the service you provide to Los Rios, Folsom Lake College, and the students you have contact with every day. I am proud to represent a district filled with so many caring, hardworking, and brilliant educators and my fellow trustees, and I hope that this year is especially rewarding, enriching, and above all, all else, successful for you and the students. Over this past week, um, uh, I've well, actually been probably the past three weeks I've had numerous engagements which involved uh, Chancellor King and most recently on Tuesday, uh, Chancellor King and Christina uh, hosted the new um, um, employee, that's not employee, or a faculty um, you know, uh, reception which was very important and I got to meet at that uh, reception I think the entire new accounting department for Folsom Lake College. <laughs> So it was a pleasure to meet uh, Casey and uh, Jennifer very much. Um, but in at all of these events, Chancellor King kept quiet and to himself about what he wanted to talk to you about here at Convocation. And so in the past, you know, he's talked about, um, you know, what's happening, what's going on, what is currently going to happen, and uh, what may happen. And I'm sure that's the discussion you're all having. But I distinctly remember the wisdom that he gave us a couple of years ago, and it came from the diary of Cecilia King. And I think we all remember the wisdom that came out of that diary, and fortunately had permission from his daughter to even tell us what it was. So with that, the wisdom from Chancellor King. Thank you, John. Well, good afternoon. Every year, this is a time we look forward to, and uh, I wonder how many of you are like me and like summer better than any other season. How many of you like summer? Summer's always been the best. It's over the quickest. And uh, as we get ready for the fall semester, summer happens so fast, and the fall semester is upon us, and one of the themes today is how fast things are going, both in our personal lives and in our work lives, and the, the, the speed of change is, is continuing to pick up. And I'm wondering how many of you, like me, have teenagers under your roof? How many of you have teenagers at home? How many of you at one point have had teenagers in your house? How many of you at one time were a teenager? <laughs> so that's almost all of us. The years go really fast as the kids get a little bit older. And uh, our two kids are 17 and 19. And uh, I think about my son, Christine, who, um, C Christian, who's now 17, starting his senior year. It seems like yesterday, that he said, Daddy, at Halloween, can we be Batman and Robin? And I said, okay, that seems like a pretty good idea. 
So we were. <laughs> he said, Daddy, that's funny because I'm little and you're big. So he understood irony. And then you blink an eye and he's looking me in the eye now getting ready for his senior year of high school. So the years go fast, and uh, I don't know if any of you are like me as a parent. You want to make sure that your kids have that balance in the summer between having a chance to rest and relax, and I hope all of you had a chance to rest and relax during the summer, but also having a little bit of structure so they're not sl sleeping through noon. Have some of you gone through that conversation with your kids? So I asked Christian to go ahead and do a schedule that he told me I've got this covered, and I said, well, will you put it in writing? So he emailed to me, and if you notice at the top of the list, he says, as recommended by Dr. King, <laughs> and you probably don't have to know my son, that he did not intend that to be a sign of respect to me because of the title. And if you look at his schedule, the first thing that might jump out is there are no times on any of, of his <laughs> events. So he's going to have breakfast, but it might be at 12.30 for all we know. And... Uh, in addition to having no times, he's going to kick off his day. First, he says, exercise, just kidding. <laughs> and then after having breakfast and lunch, he gets into the heart of his day, and the focus is on relaxation. <laughs> so not once, not twice, not three times, but four times, he's built relaxation into his schedule. And we laugh, but that's also very important for all of you, that the work we're doing has been challenging in recent years, and the pace of change has been very fast. So make sure that you do find some time, maybe not four times throughout the day to relax, but to relax and recharge as the semester begins, because we have a lot of work to do together. And it's hard for me to believe that this is the sixth time that I have been to Folsom Lake for fall convocation. Seems like just yesterday, the first convocation. And, uh, and the image behind me, one year I wore a jersey from each of our colleges, so we try to do different things along the way. And that first convocation is still very clear in my memory, and that nervousness the day before, knowing you only get one chance to make a first impression. In many ways, with the events of the last year and Governor Brown having very provocative initiatives for community colleges, so a lot of external challenges in addition to the hard work we're doing at our colleges, preparing for today has been probably led to as much sleeplessness as any convocation in the last last six years because there's a lot to say and when things are happening so quickly when change is happening so rapidly trust is more important than it ever is before and uh, in in Sacramento when I think about coming to Los Rios this is a really large place our four colleges and all of you know that if you go to the, the El Dorado Center in Placerville and then drive to the west to the Davis Center our district covers a lot of territory and when I came to Los Rios six years ago, it really was the first place I had worked where it was almost impossible to know everyone by name. So these two convocations in the fall and the spring are one of the rare opportunities for me to share something about myself and about the vision for the district. And in the time that I've been here, I'm wondering how many of you are the new employees over the last five years? Because that first convocation, I was the newest employee. How many of you have joined FLC and Los Rios in the last five years? So you look around and see so many new people and so much new energy has come during that period. So it, it's a good chance again to share with you a little bit about who I am and build that deeper understanding of one another so when we get into the really hard issues where we may not always have total consensus, we understand that we have in many ways shared background and shared value. So I'm not a California native. I wonder how many of you are. How many of you were born in the state of California? Okay, a good many of you are. How many of you live someplace where there's actually winter at some time? So you know how wonderful it is to live someplace where winter is rain and 50 degrees, am I right? Yeah. Let's give a round of applause for California weather. <laughs> My first experience in California was when I was in high school when our high school band came and was in the Tournament of Roses Parade in Pasadena. Anybody else been in the Tournament of Roses Parade? Okay, several of you have. So if you're a Midwestern kid, New Year's Day in Pasadena, it's almost inevitable you will end up in California at some point. Now for me, it didn't happen right away, but the seed was definitely planted after being in the Rose Bowl Parade in, uh, in, uh, in my junior year in high school. Finished high school, went to college. I was a history major and uh, went straight. We're, some applause for history? 
Very good. Then I went directly from college to law school, and our general counsel <laughs> is the only person who thinks that's a good thing. And at that time, I look back and realize I really didn't know any attorneys personally, and the only attorney that I really felt like I knew was Atticus Finch from To Kill a Mockingbird. So it really appealed to me, the social justice part of practicing law, and then after graduating from law school, paying off my student loans, I ended up at a large law firm in the Midwest that uh, was really one of the hardest uh, periods of my life where in those three years, there was nothing wrong with the work I was doing, but I didn't have the sense that I was helping other people. So after about three years, I had a chance to teach at a new community college in Missouri. So I taught American government and business law and also taught some organizational development at a graduate level. And when I think about that transition, in some ways that was almost inevitable too because my mother taught first grade for many years. She was and is the best teacher that I've ever known. So our family has many teachers. My sister also teaches and I see my daughter Celia is with us. She's now in college to be a teacher. So education <laughs> and that desire to be in the class classroom is something that I think was almost genetic for me. So after I made that shift and started teaching, uh, things were going really smoothly. Then I had news that many of you have probably had at some time in your life. At that time in my late 20s, I was diagnosed with cancer. So at a time when I thought I was indestructible for the next six months or so, I wondered if I was actually going to live and went through that time. And I'm really fortunate now more than 25 years later that I wouldn't have chosen that experience. But it gave me a perspective on life early on that I don't take a single day for granted. And even though the work we do is important and the issues sometimes lead to disagreements, in the broader scope of things, if we are just grateful for being here, that's a good place to start. So we spent 13 years at the new college in Missouri. I had a variety of different jobs, was fortunate to have our two children born in Missouri during that time. And then, Better late than never, we came to California in 2004. Now, we didn't just come to California, we went to Santa Cruz. Now, how many of you have spent some time in Santa Cruz? <laughs> to say it is different going from the Midwest to Santa Cruz is an understatement. So uh, Celia at that time was five, my daughter, and she actually asked me, Daddy, is Santa Cruz in the United States? And I told her barely, but then I said, don't tell your friends at school that Daddy said Santa Cruz is barely in the United States. Because what we found over, there are certainly cultural differences, but people are more alike than they are different in different parts of the world, just as that's true throughout our district. There are some cultural differences at our colleges that are valuable, but we have the same interests in mind for our students, and, and we're doing the same work together, and we have the same values. So then. Five years ago, we were able to come to Sacramento, and uh, the last several years have really flown by. It's been a delight to be a part of Los Rios and be at our colleges like Folsom Lake. And the first five years really flew by, and the last six months, a little less so, that given some of the dramatic issues we've had statewide, and one role that I played the last two years was I, I served as CEO of the, of the statewide board, uh, president of the statewide board of CEOs. So in addition to Paying to, uh, close attention to issues at the local level, I was also involved in issues at, a sta at the state level at a time when the issues were complicated and contentious. So uh, now it really emphasizes that understanding, having a deeper understanding of each other is really important when things are moving fast and the issues are hard. And as we move forward, there is a lot of work to do, and focusing on our, our core values is essential to making sure that we can do the work we need to do when there are a lot of forces that may be leaning towards divisiveness. So I next want to talk about four very important core values that I know are crucial at Folsom Lake and all of our colleges, as in, colleges and are very much values that I share. The first is our focus on equity. And I know at Folsom Lake College, you're having very courageous conversations about what we can do to close the gaps between students of color and other students. And you're on the front lines of closing the gaps in income disparity and other long-standing problems that are not unique to Folsom Lake or our, our Los Rios colleges. They're primary challenges for us as educators in 2018. 
So that first core bedrock, really a bedrock core value, is equity. The second core value is our focus on the interest-based approach at Folsom Lake and Los Rios. Now, I want everyone to stand who's gone through IBA training or is a facilitator for the interest-based approach. Just amazing. Let's give them a round of applause. Our commitment to IBA makes us very unique in the state of California, that when you are at other colleges and other districts, they don't get along the way we do, that we start with the shared interest. We recognize that if somebody wins and somebody loses, it's probably not a good outcome. So we work toward thoughtful compromises that involve co co cooperation and collaboration. So that's a second value that we share. The third value, you had a very tangible indication of how important that is yesterday, and that is our commitment to fiscal stability. Now, how many of you noticed that you had more money in your checking account yesterday than you did the day before? So many, most people across our district received a retro check, which reflects that our board and our leadership is very prudent fiscally and plans for the good times and the bad. We don't spend dollars until we have them in our district. Again, that distinguishes from almost every other community college district in the state of California, that we plan, we plan together, we don't sacrifice the long term for the short term. None of us look forward to when that next recession comes, but we'll be served very well by our, our shared value of fiscal responsibility. We've built up our reserves and we plan for the downturn economically. The fourth core value that we share is our focus on helping our students achieve their goals, and this really undergirds everything we do, our focus on helping students achieve their goals. And you see these images of our students, such a, an amazing array of students at our four colleges, the, the diversity both ethnically and politically and economically that makes this a great place to work. So we have those shared core values, that has served us well in a time where the, the pace of change is going very fast. And the pace of change does put some pressure on those values and requires us to revisit those values and have conversations with, with each other to remember that even though we may have different responsibilities, we have those shared values in doing the work together. And uh, no question that sometimes the speed of change at the national level, if you think about the halls of Washington, D.C. or in Sacramento or even City Hall, so often the discourse lately has been divisive and hasn't brought people together at a time where we need to be coming together. And I'm wondering if any of you have felt discouraged at times and wondered if things were not headed in the right direction. How many of you have had moments where you were worried about whether things were headed in the right direction? I think many of us do. And I, I read a book recently I would recommend to you called Factfulness, where the author Hans Rofling talks about data points, not just in the short term, but really more importantly, in the last 50 or 100 years that indicate we are on the right track. It's not a hopelessly optimistic book, but just a reality check that not everything, but many factors are indicating that the world is headed in a good direction. One very poignant example is infant mortality. And the definition of infant mortality is, is how many babies die before they reach their first, first birthday. Hard to even imagine the horrible experience for parents who lose a child before they reach their first birthday. So globally, in 2017, how many babies do you think died before the age of one? Anybody want to take a guess worldwide? It's about 4 million, 4.2 million babies died before their first birthday. So hard to imagine the grief and loss for the families who lost a baby in 2017. But in 1950, Smaller population, how many infants do you think died before they were able to celebrate their first birthday with their family? More than 14 million. So, again, it's not where we want to be, but if you have the long-term trend based on data, you can see the opportunity for progress. And I want to pause for a second and acknowledge that Folsom Lake College has done tremendous work in moving towards addressing the equity gaps and implementing guided pathways. We'll talk more about guided pathways in a moment. But you are on the front lines of moving the trend in the right direction. And uh, it's not easy to take the work to scale, even at Folsom Lake College, although I think you're wonderful, wonderful, wonderfully positioned to take some of the great work you're doing and spread it across the college. And that would be my first challenge to you 
to think of ways that you can identify things that are working really well in one part of Folsom Lake College and expand it throughout the college to other departments and other areas of your college. So that's the first challenge in, uh, in our optimistic future. Now the second challenge is a little bit more difficult. There are some great ideas at Folsom Lake College that have not spread to our other three colleges. Would you agree? Some things that you are doing as well as anyone in our district. And at times it's almost like there is an, imp an invisible impervious membrane between our colleges. So ideas don't travel as quickly as we need them to from one college to the other. Do you agree with that? Sometimes the good ideas don't travel and you've had some good ideas. Uh, go ahead and I, I welcome applause for the idea of spreading those good ideas. Now I'm gonna push one step forward. There might possibly be one or two good ideas at some of our other colleges that would also work well at Folsom Lake College. So I would encourage an openness to that, that with this speed of change, if we've had an opportunity to try something that works well at another one of our colleges, I understand that ownership of an idea is really important, but at the same time, if we can more quickly implement good ideas that we see from other colleges, both in our district and around the state and around the United States, I really encourage an openness to do that. So I next wanna talk about three areas where we're gonna have opportunities to work together in a spirit of cooperation and collaboration in a time of rapid change. So we're gonna talk first about uh, the three things we're gonna talk about are uh, guided pathways. Now I know you're heavily engaged in the work of guided pathways and all four of our colleges are somewhat in different places in the conversation about guided pathways and that's very healthy. When we talk about moving the needle on equity, guided pathways are, it's not a separate conversation, it's really one and the same thing. And guided pathways are the way that we're going to move the needle on equity. And uh, at, at their essence, I like the quote from da Vinci about simplicity, where Leonardo da Vinci said, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. And what we are doing for our students in re-engineering the student experience is making it simpler for them to do the right thing. It doesn't mean our work is simple, it's very hard. And I'm wondering how many of you have an iPhone or another Apple product. Hold up your iPhone if you have an iPhone. So Steve Jobs, I don't know if he gave da Vinci credit, but he really co-opted that idea about simplicity being the ultimate form of, of sophistication. And you think about what Apple has done, they've taken a product that's very complicated and made it easy to use. And uh, you see children who are under the age of five using an iPad and, and able to navigate that technology, not suggesting that's always a good thing, but simplicity has been very important in, uh, in progress. And our challenge is to make a process that can be very complicated behind the scenes, very simple, and make it easier for students to make the right choice in guided pathways. The second area of rapid change where we have great opportunity is online education. And I'm gonna present three principles and give you a little chance to push back and let me know whether you agree or not. And feel free to shoot me an email later on in the day if you think I'm absolutely wrong about these principles for online education. The first principle is that online education is going to continue to grow in importance. Raise your hand if you think that's true, that online education is continuing. I'm not asking if you think that's a good or a bad thing. I'm asking if you think online education is going to continue to grow in importance. It's very important for our colleges now, and we know that more and more students have a preference for online education. Different discussion about how to provide online education in the best way, which really leads to the second point a second principle, if we do not do online well, we're in trouble. And more specifically, mediocrity in online education is a straight line to irrelevance. How many of you agree that if we are mediocre in online education, we may not be in the online business at some point in the future? So how many of you know what this image represents? <laughs> Anybody know where that is? Bend, Oregon. There's only one left, only one blockbuster left and they're closing their doors. About 10 years ago, the founder of Netflix, Reed Hastings, the CEO, offered, made an offer to Blockbuster to sell Netflix for $50 million if Blockbuster would buy it. They did not choose wisely. So making the right choices and anticipating where future demand will be is very important. So 
I'm not suggesting that our colleges will be obsolete in the next 10 years, but it is provocative to think about in the lifetime of my children, industries that were market leaders have gone away, and we're not gonna be obsolete, but if we're not relevant in online education, we have a very substantial risk of students going to the best provider of online education. So online will continue to grow in importance. If we don't do it well, we could be out of the business. And the third premise, which is a little more of a local focus, is that our students need to be able to access the online inventory of all four of our colleges easily. Currently, if a student is trying to do all of their courses online, they have to go to four different silos at each of the colleges, find the courses, and some students amazingly find a way to do that, but one of our major focuses in the next year is going to be to have a portal where students can go and have the entire online inventory of the four Los Rios colleges in one place. Really good news in actions we've already taken. All four of our colleges are part of the Open Education Initiative. Give yourselves a round of applause for being a part of OEI. And through OEI, our students will be able to, to see not just our courses, but the inventory of courses around the state that are available online. That's an important and not insignificant next step. The step after that is to make sure that programs are accessible online. So going beyond individual courses and having students, helping students find a way to complete their courses online will be really, really important in the coming months and years. Now the third topic I wanna to talk about that is, was an incredibly rapid change where the proposal came in January from Governor Brown and the legislature approved it and it was signed into law into June, at the end of June, was our new funding formula. So interestingly, the online community college generated almost more energy and passion around the state than the funding formula did. The proposal for the online college was significant, involved $100 million in one-time funds, so that matters. But the funding formula involves seven to nine billion dollars and has a tremendous impact on our colleges. So as Governor Brown's tenure winds down, certainly there are those who disagree with those two initiatives and uh, will advocate for a change and we will have a new governor and I wanna give you a chance to cover your eyes and plug your ears if you don't wanna hear my prediction about who the next governor will be, I'm gonna take a wild stab and think that it could be Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom. So will he take a different path? He may, and we will remain very engaged with the discussion with whoever is in the governor's office and whoever is in the chancellor's office about important policy decisions. But in the short term, we do have a new funding formula. And before I talk about some specifics of the funding formula, I wanna emphasize a reality that it reflects the interest-based approach and one reason we don't fight about money at Los Rios the way so many districts do. We have a formula for compensation on how we allocate new dollars. Now, many of you know, but if you don't know, it's important that you do. How many pennies out of every dollar of new general fund revenue go to compensation? 80 cents. So 80% out of every dollar of new revenue as it should, goes to support our most important resource, our human resource of our people. So whatever the funding formula is, we have a powerful shared interest in maximizing the resources that come to Folsom Lake and the Los Rios District through the funding formula. It is entirely appropriate that we treat our people well. Fair and adequate compensation is one of our highest priorities. So old form funding formula, new funding formula, Identifying new general fund dollars through the funding formula serves us well, it serves our students, it serves our faculty and staff. A couple of things that are true about the new funding formula that may or may not be a surprise. There is a pers some perspective that the new funding formula has shifted everything towards performance-based or outcomes. There are some examples of that, but the reality is the funding, is, funding formula is still overwhelmingly based on access, the number of students we serve. 70% of the formula this year is still based on how many students we have at census day. So I am delighted to be able to share news I have not been able to share in the last, six, last five falls about enrollment. We have had slightly declining enrollment each of the last five years and today the dust hasn't settled yet, but I'm pleased to be able to announce that our enrollment is flat or very slightly up over a year ago. So that's I think worth a round of applause. 
I know you've all, all worked very hard to make sure that access is available to the students who need it, and that's going to remain an area where the funding formula is, uh, is very focused on access to students. Now, connecting the dots a little bit, as far as students who are coming purely online, what do you think the trend is at our, for, I mean, I, let's start on ground first. Students who are only taking classes on ground, what do you think the trend is at all four of our colleges? It's down. So we are even, compared to last year, even though fewer students are coming purely taking on ground classes, where is the growth? It's almost entirely online. And three of our four colleges are experiencing double-digit growth in online enrollment. So access matters, equity matters, and online is a way that we can address both equity and access issues. Certainly, there are opportunities for improvement of online and concerns about disproportionate impacts and students of color historically not doing as well in online courses. So those issues are not uh, uh, disconnected at all, doing online well and providing access to a greater number of students. The other point in the new funding formula that I think we would agree that some of the things that we will be rewarded for for doing more of are things that also benefit our students. How many of you would like more of our students to receive a Pell Grant? You know, we all would. So the funding formula will reward us for helping more students find the pathway to a Pell Grant. The funding formula also will encourage us to have more students receiving a Promise Grant, what was formerly known as the Bog Fee Weber. The formula also will reward colleges who uh, award more associate degrees for transfers, or ADTs, as well as CTE certificates and completion of English and math in the first year. So philosophical arguments aside, there are areas of the funding formula for which we will receive more funding without necessarily serving more students that are very consistent with our, meth with our, our mission and our values. So I know there's some concern that the funding formulas will have negative consequences. The good news is this year we will receive more funds than we did last year and there is a three-year hold harmless provision, so we'll, we will have a lot of time to work through the funding formula and make sure that we're doing the right things for our students that also help provide more general fund dollars to, to provide more services and compensation for everyone involved. So I can guarantee you that we will continue to fight for Folsom Lake and all of our colleges in the Capitol, and we'll have opportunities to influence the funding formula and make it better as we move forward. So, in short, it is an exciting year coming up, and in a lot of ways, want to emphasize that the work we've been doing since we adopted our strategic plan three years ago is very consistent with Guided Pathways. It positions us very well to make good decisions under the new funding formula to increase the revenue for Folsom Lake and the Los Rios Colleges. So our strategic plan is very much in line with the direction, by and large, that's been taken by policymakers. So we're in a good spot as we enter 2018. So as we start a new year, part of me would like to be able to tell you that the rate of change is going to slow down, that there won't be any external forces that are disruptive, that we'll have great leadership in Washington, Sacramento, that uh, is consistent in their approach to community colleges, and that there's a high likelihood that policymakers will recognize we've been chronically underfunded and we're going to have billions of more dollars into the community college system. Wouldn't that be nice? It's good to dream, and we'll keep making the argument. But as we prepare for 2018, the reality is that many things will again happen that we can't control that will try to drive us apart if we don't remember those core values and, and our deeper understanding of each other trying to do the right thing even in difficult times. So the rate of, of change is likely to continue to be quite rapid, and there will be external factors beyond our control that we'll have to deal with. What we can control is that commitment to our core values, the commitment to equity, the understanding that the interest-based approach is the right approach for us, and cooperating and collaborating and coming together and making compromises. So because we have those shared values, I'm very optimistic and excited about the coming year that it will be a breakthrough year for Folsom Lake and that we're gonna go from a conversation that's been, on, been going on for a while about guided pathways to making even more tangible steps forward that are gonna transform the lives of our students. 
So I very much appreciate the opportunity to spend a little bit of time with you today. I encourage you to let me know uh, what you think and more importantly, how I can help you. So thank you very much for your time today and have a great semester.